so Lord Diltari has a subscribe star also known as the Paladin. I would really recommend anyone who's invested in this story to go over and check it out. It's a solid way to help support the author and help get stories like this written. So check out the top link in the description. Though let's start will we? Be me, Paladin, Lord of Slimy Bastards. No offense Jubilex. Because Dor the Just, Senkit the Blunt, Peregrine the Honest, Andre the Pragmatic, Eort the Treacherous, and Julian the Ruthless. The party is almost ready to get moving once again, if not for the small issue of setting up the roads between the Abbey and the newly colonized Dwarven Mountain. Work has already begun on chopping down large sections of the forest and patrollers are going out on the regular, almost everything is going well. Julian and the Ort are up in the command center they've made out of what was once Clunny's suite. Poring over charts and maps they have pinned to various walls reviewing large swathes of the lands in the south controlled by the Paladins. Patrol routes are marked out, monster dens are highlighted depending on their various state, detected, scouted, clearing, cleared, and detailed lists of local formations are laid out. Along the side of the wall is a large table with a map laid atop it. Various wooden blocks representing different units and individuals lie across it, with a cluster of dice nearby. The war game shows a combined force of humans, dwarves, elves, halflings, and goblins facing off against a hobgoblin legion with goblin and bugbear singulaires. Julian sighs as he examines a logistics report. We need more polearms, halberds in particular to maximize unit effectiveness. Plus, more work in general with combined human dwarf formations. I'll send a letter to Kaz about that, personally I'm more concerned about our lack of decent battlefield commanders. Robert, fill in. And the set are all decent on the field, but we need more of an officer corps if we're actually going to implement any of these strategies in an open battle. Eort responds. Perhaps, or if we could get more disciplined troops. None of Clunny's intelligence leads turn anything up about finding another legion we could potentially sway to our cause. Not much, I can confirm that there are certainly more legions out there, estimates show we could have about a score scattered across the land. But around half of those haven't got any reports more recent than five years ago, and two were listed as in San Jonas, I think we can effectively call those lost. Or purged. There were camp ruins, shame we didn't have times to investigate. Still, nine or ten missing legions, where the hells could those have gone? Gods only know. It's entirely possible that they've simply been destroyed or absorbed into another legion without our knowing. Still, even worst case scenario we have anywhere between 10 and 20 thousand warriors out there. If we could unite that force, we could take San Jonas and hold it. I still think that's overly optimistic. San Jonas was a city large enough to maybe even hold a hundred thousand, even when we had multiple legions in the city, we probably never controlled more than half of it at once. Which brings us back to the problem of the city. Julian says, looking at one particular map, crafted by the combined efforts of Andre, Eort, and the Kibolds, showing the sprawling ruin of a capital in great detail. It's a great location in peacetime, but its central location means it can be attacked from any angle we don't already control. Coupled that with our lack of manpower, reclaiming the capital may be a long ways off. We'll get it back. Eort promises. Even if we have to spend a decade getting there. The paladins are interrupted by a knock at the door. Come. The legate and the warmaster say at once. A nervous looking man in armor opens the door. Ah, Robert, what is it? Julian asks. Pardon my interruption sirs, the scouts are reporting that we've discovered a wolf den. Should I gather a hunting party? Robert asks. No, I'll handle that myself with some singulaires. If we play our cards right that could potentially be another unit or two of Wolf Cave. Apologies Julian, we'll have to continue our match later. No issue, go, we need that cavalry. Julian says, dismissing his officer and the ought. He smiles as the two leave. Decent commander that Robert, needs to take more initiative though. He remarks to Bast. He's overly cautious, good for defense but little else. Also, another intruder approaches. Intruder. Who oh? The bard. Julian says, and Bast nods. Julian places his lightning claw to his forehead and shakes it back and forth. With the upcoming work towards elections for representatives on the council, Williams had been on a bit of a charm offensive. Julian couldn't really blame the spoony bastard, he'd done the same thing to ensure his own popularity before pushing the constitution, but it was ever so slightly obnoxious. Williams entered without bothering to knock. Ah, cheers Lord Tyrann, I was just passing by and thought I'd say hello. Julian will do, Williams. Tyrann is the name I give to fairies and employers. You're not nearly as fair as you pretend to be, and I stopped working for you several months ago. 
Julian responds casually. Ah, well, Lord Julian it is. Williams answers with a manicured smile as he seemingly absent-mindedly reaches down and pets Bast. Kill him. Kill him now and kill him slowly. The fiendish familiar demands, though it doesn't do anything. Trust me, I'd love to, but I need something of a causes belie. Then at least make him stop. Bast practically begs. You know I'm not really a cat and this is simply demeaning. Well, while you're here, care for a game of chess? Oh, well I have played some, and may as well. Could be a good bit of experience for during one of my shifts in a hunting party. Indeed. I find it's a decent tool for evaluating a person's strengths and style in command. Even though a situation where you're perfectly matched on entirely flat terrain is so oversimplified as to be insulting. Julian responds as he draws Williams away from Bast before the familiar. Makes a horrific mess in the map room. The Arsimus sets up a simple chess game and Bast thinks pleasant thoughts involving the bard, a barrel of lemon juice, and a cheese grater. I'll take white if you don't mind. Julian says as he takes his seat. Oh, and no magic please. Oh, wasn't planning on it. It sounds like there's a story there though. Ah, happened while I was serving some petty king or another. His court sorcerer used magic to read my mind while we were playing. I didn't find it out until after I had left. I simply thought he was rather good at chess. Julian tells his story, faking a minor flush of embarrassment. Several moves take place as he talks. Really? Well that's not quite sportsmanlike. William says sympathetically as he moves his knight. No, not really. Julian responds, moving out a bishop. But it was rather effective. I would imagine so. Williams responds. Knowing your opponent's thoughts, or anyone's thoughts really. Quite a handy trick. Would have saved me more than a few stained shirts when I was starting out. The game continues in the background of the conversation. Since neither I nor Julian's player actually played chess, I'm not going to even bother trying to recreate the game that plays out. To summarize how it goes in broad strokes, Julian begins setting up a complex series of traps that allow him to maneuver across a large portion of the board unmolested. But there is a large gap which Williams exploits before he can complete his net. The worst part was I didn't even realize. That's part of the reason I wrote the office of Lord Commander the way I did. Ah, it's multiple people to prevent any one person from falling under a spillcaster's sway. Yes, I'm well aware of the power even a small bit of magic can do, believe me. Julian says, one of his eyes flashing ever so briefly with the flicker of light passing between his eye and the bards. It actually became quite a problem when we fought that mind flare in San Jonas. Julian moves his king forwards. HM, it can certainly be the cause of no end of trouble, at least for everyone but the midge in question. The willy bard says with a mild grin. He moves up his queen. Check. Julian moves his king to the side, and Williams moves up his knight. Checkmate. Good game. Indeed. I'll see you around Williams. Julian responds as Williams gets up and heads out. What the devil was it about? I've seen you win in less than two moves from that same setup. You could have taken his queen and then checkmated him with your knight and your bishop, but you retreated like an amateur. Bast asks the Arsima curiously. The funny thing about that strategy is you have to bait the trap. You have to get them to use their rooks to plug the net they think they see so the king can't castle, and then put out your king to show weakness so they'll bite. Julian responds as he packs up the board. Though personally, I think it works better if you're black. Somewhat later that same day, Julian wanders his way into the chapel where Senkit is praying, as usual. She raises an eyebrow as she sees he's carrying something. Julian, there had better be a damned good reason why you're carrying a bouquet of flowers, and a bet is not a good reason. No, these are a bribe. I have far better things to do than try to seduce a remarkably voluptuous brick wall. Julian admits. I need a slightly strange favor. Julian. Why is the gods' names did you feel the need to bribe me, and what in all nine hells and a tenth thrown on for good measure possessed you to think that flowers was enough of a bribe? Even assuming I'd take those. Nothing, but the attempt is strange enough and the favor weird enough that you're going to go along with it out of slightly morbid curiosity. Again, with this favor, what is it? I just need you to be standing by the entrance to Cavern Hall when me and Williams walked into the next meeting and the next meeting to be one where we start to discuss who we think would make good candidates for the election. This is once again weirdly specific and makes me think you're up to some manner of mischief that's going to end with some manner of food on my face or perhaps a lack of clothing. Trust me, it's entirely the opposite. This is an overly complicated but entirely necessarily sure way of putting an end to a certain batch of mischief that I cannot specify for reasons that will become apparent once my plan goes into effect.
Senkit stares at his deadpan expression, then sets the flowers on fire. You're acting strangely, so I'll be there, because I highly doubt you would make this much of a fool of yourself unless you had a very good reason. It was either this or leave the flowers with a note in Kaza's handwriting style, and I figured I'd rather just have just you trying to kill me if it went wrong rather than you and Kaz together. Because he can fly too. Senkit pulls out her mace. Get out of my chapel. Now. Julian wisely complies while his family jewels are still intact. This is entirely unnecessary, we could just kill him. Bust chastises him, but Julian shrugs. True, but this makes certain I'm viewed as righteous even after a bit of murder and it gives me an excuse to mess with the good abbess. I don't allow myself too many indulgences, I don't drink heavily, pursue women, or eat over much. I will at least allow myself the small joy of messing with people who are in great need of rectal surgery to remove a column or two. A day later, Senkit does hold to her word and calls a meeting to begin to discuss who would make good candidates for the new council. Julian arrives early, and after having bust confirmed that Senkit is in position, he leans by the wall and waits. As he waits, he pulls out a platinum coin from his purse and begins to flip it up in the air and try to catch it. Once he manages this, he starts trying to catch it on the back of his hands. Since he's wearing gauntlets and not all that agile, he drops it several times as he does this. After about five minutes of constant effort, he manages to do it successfully. After completing this, he starts to try to roll it between his fingers, messing up again as it pops off and flies through the air until a familiar hand catches it. Williams tosses the coin behind his back and over his shoulder, catching on the back of his hand and rolling it between his fingers, popping it into the air along with several other silver coins before collecting them in a bag and tossing a coin back at Julian. Show off. Julian chuckles good-naturedly as he catches the coin and places it back in his bag. He doesn't look at it, he doesn't need to. The wait alone tells him that coin was silver, not platinum. Excellent. I am an entertainer, it's what I do. Still, good to see you again friend. William says with a honeyed smile, and Julian senses the flicker of magic. He doesn't bother resisting it, instead letting the bard's subtle charm take hold. It's good to see you too. I take it you know a candidate you think would do well in the coming election. Well of course I know him, he's me. The bard chuckles. I hope I can count on your support in front of the council. Of course, I always help my friends. The charmed Simmer says. Bast looks at this, wanders into a privy, assumes her true form just long enough to shut the door, and then vomits repeatedly. Robert passes by, becoming slightly concerned at the sound, and knocks. Are you all right in there? Should I fetch a healer? He asks kindly. When he hears no response, he waits. Then he waits some more. After a few minutes, he starts to worry whoever it is may have fallen into the privy and opens the door. He is very confused to find it empty, and even more confused when Bust brushes past his legs. He turns to the cat and shuts the door. I must be going mad, or that was nine hells of a hairball, he mentions as he turns to shut the door, oblivious to the large claw marks around the stone seat. Large enough ones that a human-sized creature might have made them. Julian and Williams walk into the hall, past Senkit, who watches them curiously, then her eyes go wide as she realizes her aura just suppressed a magical effect. She looks at Julian, who gestures for her to stay close. She follows him, gesturing for him to sit next to her on her left, with Kaz on her right. We are called together to discuss the candidates for the upcoming election, but a more serious matter has just been brought to my concern. Senkit introduces. Namely, that someone has used magic to influence the mind of a Lord Commander, specifically Julian. William's eyes go wide, and he gets up to bolt for the door when Julian stands up and reaches out. The Conqueror's mailed fist clenches and the Bard feels an iron claw seize him by the throat and lift him off the floor. He clutches at his throat, choking and gasping for air. Julian, let him speak. We stand in a zone of truth, he cannot deceive us. Senkit orders the Asima, finally understanding why he didn't simply tell her outright. It would have been a remarkably sketchy thing to say that he suspected someone was going to try to mind control him and he wanted her to stand by to dispel the effect. Julian opens his fist and turns his hand palm down, dropping the bard and instead forcing him to his knees. Speak, he commands the bard, who now recognizes the magic from being used before. Damn you. You knew I'd try this and now you've hung me. He curses the Asima. No, only given you enough rope. Julian responds coldly. He isn't activating his aura of terror, but Williams is terrified regardless. He manages to squirm free from the hold person and runs for it, vanishing as he goes. After him, Julian shouts, 
sprinting after the invisible bard, followed swiftly by the rest of the order and the council. Their efforts are in vain though. A trail of footprints leads to the gate, and then vanishes into the forest. Search parties are quickly assembled and sent out, Julian among them. As the sun begins to set, the bard finally stops to catch his breath. It's taken most of his spells, but he managed to stay invisible for long enough to get away. Damn that angel, and the Chultown Hall too. They tricked him, he could have gamed this government and been fat and happy for life but no, they had to trick him. His elven ears perk up as he hears a strange sound, metal scraping against metal, like someone snapping their fingers while wearing a gauntlet. A bolt of lightning tears out of the blue and blasts the bard into ashes. Nothing survives except the buttons on his coat, his belt buckle, his rapier, and his bag of coins, mostly silver and gold, but with one platinum coin. Julian walks up as the wind blow the bard's ashes away and pockets his coins, buries the sword, buckle and buttons, then walks away. Problem dealt with. Now, whether to decide whether to see Mary or Robert as the representative for the humans. Be me, Paladin, Lord of conveniently well hidden planar crossings and references to other more popular pieces of media. Because Dor the Salamander, Andre the Raven Guard, Peregrine the Phoenix, Senkit the Fist, Eort of the Purged, and Julian the Black, Paladins of Order Undivided. With a minor bit of politically motivated disintegration out of the way, the party is finally, finally ready to get moving again to seek out the lost Dvarvan and Elven holds in hopes of securing even more territory. Unfortunately for them, fate and level issues say otherwise, as there's yet more trouble at home. A major road is being constructed between Mount Avernius and the Abbey to facilitate trade and transportation, mostly being handled by a Dwarven contingent. However, two work crews have failed to report back. With the sudden absence of two dozen hearty warriors, the paladins themselves decide to investigate. They make excellent time down the sections of the road that have already been constructed. Dwarven stonework combined with human ingenuity and hobgoblin efficiency has made the effort incredibly swift, allowing the paladins to travel in hours what took them a day during their quest to defeat the dragon. Soon though they come to where the first work crew vanished. The effort was begun from both sides, one crew working from the mountain towards the abbey, and one from the abbey towards the mountain. Both vanished in the same day, approximately the same distance from their respective holds. That is very unlikely to be a coincidence. The paladins arrived to a scene of no small devastation. The wagon filled with bricks has been overturned, scattering the stones across the earth. The road itself has been torn up for quite a distance back, as though something erupted from beneath. The milestone lies shattered, as though a great hand had seized it and crushed it to powder. They approach warily, each taking a look at the investigation in their own particular manner. Andre looks for tracks, but whatever hit this place churned up the earth in several directions leading deeper into the forest. Their trails aren't exactly concealed, but it's impossible to tell what hit it. Peregrine wanders about until something shiny catches his eye, wandering over he sees large drops of some solid golden substance. He pokes it with a stick and finds it as hard as a rock. Looking over it again, he sees there's quite a bit of it scattered about, then his eyes go wide. There's a rather large hole, like someone ripped sections of the earth out of the ground a ways off to the side. More torn up earth leads to it. Cause door searching turns up something worrying nearby. An axe, clearly of glamdring make lying by the wayside. He examines it and finds it in good condition, aside from the strange golden stone coating the edge. He taps it. Sniffs it, then licks it. Amber, fossilized tree sap. That doesn't make any sense though, how would Amber get on an axe on the surface? Julian meanwhile begins to conduct the ritual to reveal magic. As he completes it, his eyes go wide. The forest lights up as though it was Christmas time, magic hangs in the air like fog on a dock at night. It thickens in a deeper section nearby, growing brighter and tighter deeper into the woods. Oh shit. Fairies. He hazards a guess. This place is very close to the Fi Wild after all. I get a bad feeling we annoyed them. He continues to search and notes the amber on the axe cause door is holding also gleams with magic. It's strangely similar to the glow of fresh blood, and there's other bits scattered about. He follows it over and finds the whole peregrine is investigating. Similar magic is rooted into the earth around here, only very recently disrupted. Julian drops the spell, intensely suspicious. I think we may have annoyed the natives by mistake. There's thick magic here, maybe even a crossing somewhere nearby, and something powerful was here in this hole until very recently. Do you think they dug it up? Andre asks. No, too far out of the way from the road. They wouldn't have even started digging at this point, they would still be clearing away the trees. Eort says as he observes it. So, it pulled itself up for some reason. 
We've been through this area before though and nothing bothered us though. Why attack the builders, it's certainly far enough off that they wouldn't have bothered it? Andre ponders. Not to mention this is summer territory, Seely Fay. The fairies are tricksters and capricious, but this kind of outright hostility is more along the lines of winter. Julian confirms, his arcane studies coming to the fore again. Not all of them, the one who led the giants was a wild fay, this could have been a similar rogue. Eort responds. A brief explanation for those not familiar with the fairy folk. Fairies are divided among the four courts of the seasons, summer, winter, spring, and autumn. Summer fay are almost universally seely, or non-hostile to mortals. This doesn't mean they're helpful, they can be tricksters and mess with mortals even more than winter, but they aren't usually outright malicious. Winter are unseely, meaning they are directly hostile to mortals. Autumn and spring swing both ways. However, there do exist powerful fairies outside the courts. These rogue or wild V are unpredictable. They include such mighty figures as the Earl King and can be both wicked and goodly in equal measure. Whatever it was, it's not here anymore, Julian says. If its blood is this bright this long after it was shed then it would stand out like a wildfire in a forest of icicles. Great, so there's an unknown fairy running about that's brawny enough to fight a dozen no me folk and me leave survivors I'll trace their bodies. Cause door scowls. Arthur grudge they settle. Andre, can ye track it? No way to tell which of these is the original. There's clear trails but no way to tell which one it was. There might even have been multiple assailants. Wait, the blood. If that's on the axe, then it will be bleeding. Check for more amber. Sanctit realizes. The party quickly examines the various trails and turns it up in the one headed north by northwest, deeper into the woods. Julian looks grimly at it, for it leads directly into where the mists of magic were thickest. Kazdor, your armor is all steel isn't it? He asks calmly. As is the rest of yours I imagine. I, unfortunately we need be arena and they scorch the blighters. No, that's a good thing. I get a bad feeling that this thing went home. Back to fairy and bringing iron and that is like taking poison into another's home. The fey haven't been foes to us thus far and making an enemy of them would be a remarkably bad idea considering how close we are to the fey wild. Julian responds. You're actually suggesting we don't go in crossbow cock smiting everything that moves for once. Peregrine suggests with a grin. Oh, we should definitely be ready for trouble considering everything we've met taller than five feet has been actively trying to rip out our various organs and do various horrible things to our corpses. But bringing chemical weapons on our first visit would probably be an undiplomatic move. Cause Dord and Dundry chuckle, and the party checks their provisions. They've got enough food and water for a journey, and they do have a fine excuse to get away from the politics. When given the option between pursuing a monster into another plane of existence which they have very little information on or doing more administrative and political nonsense. The paladins do what adventures naturally do. Elk prances, hound bounds, war pig trundles, ignored on tramps, and two horses canter through the woods with Nray glance behind. They ride hard on the trail until twilight, when the shadows grow long, and the world turns golden in the light of the low-hanging sun. They arrive in a clearing where the trail ends. The branches hang low over the clearing, giving the illusion of a cathedral with branches for a roof and trunks for columns. The party walks into the center, looking about to see where the trail goes next, looking this way and that until the air shifts. The leaves and grass seem greener, the smell of the forest more intense. The sunlight is more golden and the shadows darker and more mysterious. Every sense seems to be heightened, passions intensify. There was neither drama nor fanfare. No gate of curving branches or swaying mists that blow away to reveal a new landscape. Slowly, subtly, gently, this is how the Fire Wild takes travelers in. If the party were not more aware, they might not have noticed it at all. Julian looks about warily. He has walked these fair paths before and knows them to be the best of places and the worst of places. Senk it is unfazed, for her gods watch over her here as surely as beneath the less golden sun. Peregrine is excited, a new world, so many new paths yet to wander and things to see. Kazdor is taking great care to keep the smoldering anger for his kin in check, he has always forced himself to see clearly and will need that ability now more than ever. Eort feels nothing. The Fey has no charms for him, for he is fundamentally the same sort of soul, a trickster and a shadow. Andre though feels the strangest feeling of all, a mix of nostalgia and homesickness. The nostalgia is strange, for she has not ever been here before. Her soul remembers though, remembers its creator, of the glory of Evander, even if it walked many long lives along paths dark with neither moon nor starlight, but only cold arcana and burning chaos. 
with it comes homesickness, as though she had walked into another treetop home above the river of another elven city, near a similar bakery and fishery as to the one she had once owed. The Inquisitor shakes her head to clear it. This was the illusion of the Firewild, a thing close enough to rend the heart with echoes of glory that cannot be reclaimed. That home had burned, the bakery and the fishery with it. Loth. All thanks to that demon Loth. Andre's hatred actually sharpens the air, making the area around her seem clearer, with harder edges and brighter colors. Senkit sees it and she places her hand on the elf's shoulder, calming the Inquisitor down. The distortion fades. Are you okay? The abbess asks. Fine. This place intensifies emotions, and then emotions affect the area around us. I just didn't expect it to be quite as intense. Andri says, shaking her head to force herself back to reality. It's fine. This place is plainly insane. Let's find our missing dwarves, or the monster that killed them, and get out of here. Julian says bluntly. He and the rest look around, but there's nothing new revealed. If not for the change in the air and the emotional arousal, they could have been back in the mortal world. The trees are in the same place, the trail they followed is still there, the sun is wait a minute. Julian follows the trail backwards a bit and then lets out a short laugh. Oh, that's clever. He chuckles. The trail doubles back, the same way it came into the clearing in the mortal world, then curves off to the side. He waves the others over and they get moving, following the new trail westwards. The day does grow dim though, and the sun sets. The party summits a hill in the last hour or so of the dying light. It is well worth it. The sunset here is unlike anything any of them have ever seen, a magnificent wonder of spiraling, swirling colors like petals of countless prismatic shades all stemming from the golden sun. Even stoic Senkit has to stop and admire it for a while. The party rouses itself from its reverie as a cold wind blows across the hill, reminding them of the coming night. They quickly set to work on setting up their camp and cooking dinner. Peregrine's food tastes especially good tonight, though whether this is because of the fey atmosphere, the appetite they've worked up with travel, or simply a particularly well-made meal none can tell. They set their watches, though this time all six take a shorter shift. The stars are bright and the moon brilliant, such that even Gazdor and Peregrine can see well enough. Even after their shifts are done, each member lingers a while longer gazing up into the heavens. The brilliant stars twinkle like gemstones on velvet, in colors not seen in the mortal realm. The constellations are strange and new, and great bands of scarlet and indigo light the heavens like the Milky Way of our world. During Andri's shift, her keen ears catch the sound of pan flutes. Looking to the sound, she spies a far-off clearing, with satyrs and Eladrine dancing the night away, deep in their cups. Andri knows better though than to follow that gay festivity, for the wild dances of the Fae are perilous for mortals. And I'm using gay in the original sense of the word, not to imply homosexuality, though there's probably a fair bit of it as well. Not all the sights of the Fae are so benign though. Kazdor hears a hunting horn during his watch and turns to look for it. Near the horizon, he can see a great mass of shadowy, predatory figures riding across the night. At their head is a great creature, the height of a giant, yet regal as a king. His face is enshaden, his form hung with the pelts of mighty beasts. A horn is in his hand and a hunting spear in the other. He is crowned with brambles in the shape of antlers, and his eyes are fire. The burning eyes of the Earl King turn and see the sharp sapphires of the Dragon Prince. The hunter raises his spear, as though beckoning his door to come and join him. Predatory instincts rise, to hunt, to feast, to burn, to gather and to hoard. Sivrid and Gazdor both feel the call of the wild hunt. Fortunately, Gazdor is accustomed to suppressing his baser urges, and stands his ground to refuse the Earl King's call. The shadowy lord rides on, and Gazdor stands his watch alone. The party rests the night away in remarkably intense, but pleasant dreams, and awakens, Peregrine still not entirely certain if he is awake or yet dreaming. Kazdor relates the night's events, and Julian's eyes go wide. The Arsima lets out a low whistle. Well, thank whatever gods are listening that we weren't camped over there. The wild hunt. Bloody Helkers, you've glimpsed something as rare to see and live as it is great and terrible. If I were a superstitious man I'd call that nine hells of an omen. Kazdor shrugs nonchalantly. Ah, I'm neither type to go along with fairy nonsense, even though the laird leading the hunt seemed my sort. Julian just shakes his head and chuckles, before the party continues on its way following the strange trail. It continues on for another few hours before it abruptly stops in a bog. Here the wet sucking ground has absorbed the trail. Andri climbs a nearby tree and peers into the distance. She can see it again, faintly on the other side of the bog, on an island of sorts where tall trees grow proudly. The party therefore prepares to traverse the bog. 
Julian pulls out his spellbook and conducts a short ritual, before invoking a small disc to carry Peregrine on. Kazdor picks up Senkit to carry her across, and Julian carries Andri. Yort sits and waits for them to return for him, practicing his swordsmanship while he waits. As Julian flies across, his lightning claw sparks slightly as the last of the charges regenerates. Below him, something starts rolling after him beneath the mud, drawn to the electricity. Soon after, two other similar creatures roll after him. The party lands on the island in the bog before Kazdor flies back across to retrieve Yort. As they wait, Andre notices several bulges in the mire rolling towards them. She alerts the party, who back off away from the swamp to atop the roots of one of the great trees. Weapons are drawn and made ready for the coming onslaught. Three great messes of twisted foliage and fungus shamble up blindly from the swamp, stinking of death and decay. Shambling mounds, nobody use any electricity. Julian warns as vengeful spirit ignites. Peregrine similarly ignites his short swords, and then the roots under them move. The paladins stagger away as several of the trees turn towards them, particularly towards their flaming weapons. Branches reach down like arms, as hollows and shifts in the back begin to resemble faces. One tree uproots itself, stepping forwards and shooing away the shambling mounds like a human might shoo away a guard dog. The tallest of the trees raises a branch and waves it like a disapproving finger. Put down your fire, mortals, do not do anything too hasty. It speaks with the voice of a forest whose veins run thick with amber. Be me, a paladin too hasty for my own good. Be Julian the rather hasty, Peregrine the far too hasty, Castor the slightly hasty, Andre the not hasty, Senkit the vaguely hasty, and the Oort the possibly hasty. It is a good thing Castor is only slightly hasty, as he flies in carrying Oort across the shambling swamp only to see the rest of the party surrounded by a half dozen mildly angry looking ants. Note, ants constantly look at least mildly angry due to being giant people made out of trees. That shit is intimidating even if you are a fire-breathing holy warrior carrying two axes. In fact, it might be even more intimidating in that circumstance. As such, the party opts for diplomacy rather than stabbing as the dragonborn and his hobgoblin passenger land near the rest of the crew. The ants aren't attacking, or even getting too close, but they do loom over the party menacingly from every angle, setting them on edge. The one chewing away the shambling mounds returns. He is visibly quite an old tree, a tall you slenderer than his compatriots even in spite of his advanced age. He walks with a certain spring in his step, as though the wood is still green and fresh. His eyes are amber bright and clearly awake, and most unusually of all he has what looks like an unsized bag on his back. Aram, ah, there are the last two of you. Ask alone, Echo, Scourge, Mid-Lieutenant, by wing and by disc, star crowned and brute by wing and by grip, he says, turning to each of the paladins in turn calling each one a different name. Order undivided, just as the turning of the world says it should be. If you want an easy example of what this guy would sound like, think Parthanax from Skirim. Are you sure you don't mean someone else? Julian asks. None of us are called any of those things. Not yet, dragons they are. The tree tells him. But I have walked a long while and seen the world turning since before the abbey's first stone was laid. I have learned how things turn, and heart sim them. You are not Ask alone yet, but you bear his sword and claw, and his path is all about you. So, you're a seer then. You've seen our futures. Senkit asks curiously. Julian opens his mouth to protest, but the ant stops him. After a manner of things. I have watched you, watch the land, and watch the machinations of the heavens and the earth. I do not know, for to say that you know anything about the future for certain is far too hasty for my liking, but I can hazard a dim guess. It explains. And before you ask, Echo, I cannot tell you any but what you may yet be called, or that would tilt the world, and things could very quickly spin into courses darker. Then I'm afraid you have us at a bit of a disadvantage, you know us, but we don't know you. Peregrine offers. I know names are a rather tricky thing here, so what should we call you? HM, clever and ever the diplomat, yes. My name is not one you could hear, let alone speak, but most folk call me a rider. For I am one of the few old shepherds who yet wanders about taking his flock as it needs me. I used rider the sage answers them. By my authority, such as it is, be welcomed to Anizent, which means Isle of the Ants. Ah thank ye for the welcome maestri used rider, but ah I'm afeard we can I stay long, me folk are vanished and we must find them. HM, as expected. The dwarves who took their axes to Batangled's flock. They are here, standing trial as it were. What, trial? Kazdor says, wrath beginning to build, but checked by wisdom. Indeed, Patengild is normally a forgiving sort, 
but his temper was soured by their axes, and in his anger and age he mistook them for short orcs up to mischief. This news does nothing to calm the steadily boiling dragonborn, and the temperature in the glade increases by several degrees, in addition to the minor glow that his scales are starting to take on. Cause Dor sees clearly enough to know that these are not wicked folk though, and that his own rage is not justified. He takes a deep breath and quenches his anger. Cold sapphire eyes meet with wise amber ones. Then, I will need to meet with this betangled then. Cause Dor says slowly. The imp nods approvingly. What was your case for sending them into the forest in the first place? Ayus Rider asks curiously. They make a way on a straight path through the woods that folk might travel safely and swiftly across it between the new hold in the mountain and Hearthfire Abbey. And perhaps later they bring a road wind dying back to the pass that brought us here so more folk could come though. Cause Dor answers honestly. If I kenned that ye and your folk were living there, I'd have come and asked your permission first, but I never saw even one o oh year for, and I need kenned how they tell if I had. I see, why ask for permission? And another thing, what will you do if Batangle continues to hold his charge? This is your land, though I didn't ken it was, it's knee right to take it firm ye. Ye have a duty to protect the trees and the land for their ye folk. Just as I will have a duty to protect my folk, even if I have to come to blows with goodly folk like yourselves to do it. Kazdor says, crossing his arms and looking at the ants. There's no bravado nor intimidation in his voice, but equally is there no room whatsoever for him to move on that last point. I've heard enough. My judgment was hasty after all our use rider. A great dark oak of a tree says, crossing his arms. I withdraw the accusation against the dwarves. But Engeld speaks. If this is their king, then there cannot be mischief in their hearts. He is too honest even for his own good. Ah, I'm near king, and if one thing they talk to the laddie who holds a charge against Matin is too honest, ah, I'm content to be damned that way. Kazdor says, turning towards the end. Who glowers back at him. That's the fay for you. Julian says with a shrug. Even the least fay of them. That was meant as a compliment by the way. He adds quickly. Aram, you are certainly no courtesan, but neither are we, you are correct. Let the set bicker for all we care. It is meaningless in the end. Ayust Rider tells him. Go and get the dwarves from the jail, to send them back. He requests of a younger and, who departs towards the deeper parts of the island. Come, you are guests, and guests will need to eat and drink and the sunlight and water does not nourish you in the same ways. He beckons the paladins, and they follow. He leads them to a great stone building held together not with mortar, but entirely with careful positioning of each individual stone. What makes this feat even more impressive is that the stones are not carved, each one is as though it was lifted off the ground and simply added to the building. In spite of this, it stands as tall and broad as any mead hall and seems as sturdy as even a dwarven fortress. Because Dor looks at this in no small amount of wonder, though the rest of the party doesn't appear to share his enthusiasm for stonework. How the devil did ye craft this then? He asks a used rider, who chuckles. Even raw stone and boulder makes fine mortar if one takes their time with it, Aaron. But long years and many seasons is too slow for shorter lived folk, even Corellan's children. The end responds and leaves the party to wonder just how old he is then. He returns swiftly bearing great stone bowls and a tall bottle of something. Fair food is perilous indeed for the unwary, but drafty eyes too honest to be fair. Do not fear for anything here then. For you are foes of the blight, and perhaps then on at least a similar side. He tells them as he pours out the draft. Which is like someone brewed the earth and all the life living there that all forget about into a drink. Julian looks at his warily, and Bast likewise takes a wary look. I am fairly certain this is just dirt that has somehow been turned into alcohol. The cat says. If these were dwarves, I might believe you. Julian responds. Senkit is actually the first to take a drink. It is hearty and fortifying, as though someone combined the character of a fine stout with the pleasant warmth of summer sunshine, then bolstered it with a strong rye bread. Though it is only drink, it is as satisfying as a full meal, and quite enjoyable. The other paladins follow suit, even Bast takes a lick, though the devil finds it distasteful. Trees are solid stuff, but this is still too fey, too much chaos for my liking. True, but you'd think drinking liquid chaos would result in more ridiculous effects. If you start rambling about sauce or trying to eat anything and everything including the lore and the mountain again, I will kill you, summoning bindings or no I will find a way. Noted. Query for the readers, would you want a short blooper post explaining that particular bit of non-canon nonsense? Regardless of the fact that they are drinking magic, it still bolsters and benefits them as though they had enjoyed a full meal. 
They sit back with full bellies and a general sense of pleasant satisfaction. Erem, now is a good time for resting and waiting. The full belly and satisfied stomach is good for hospitality and poor for negotiations. Ah, here your folk are star crowned. Ayus Rider says as he sits back and points. Kazdor turns and sees a dozen of his folk, the Abyside work crew approaching. He leaves the table and goes to meet them. As he approaches, he sees that they were treated well. There are still some bandages and bruises, but no serious harm was inflicted, or if it was it has since been healed. They do not look as though they have missed any meals, nor suffered over much from their stay in the Umpt's jail. Lord Kazdor, it's good to see you, though I feel rather ashamed about having to have been rescued from a tree of all the things. The leader says as he bows before his prince. Rise. The Umpt's are mighty folk which even I would not trifle with lightly. There is no shame. Where are your other kin, the ones working from the mountain? The leader's face grows confused, then dark. Ah, I did not know that the other team had been taken as well. We were the only prisoners the Ents had. If they were taken, it was not by the trees. Kazdor's eyes narrow, his face goes dark with concern. Very well then, once we have finished our negotiations here and seen you back safely, then I shall have to seek out the others then, he says. I fear their captors may have been more capricious than the tree shepherds. The dragonborn heals the rest of the minor injuries and walks back to the table, his face grim. The others look at him with concern. I used rider, ah didn't he have a great deal o' oh, time to sit and rest. Ah thank you for return I'm kin, but it seems the other team is still missine. Ah needs be done with the aglin or the road and tay be gone tay find the rest. Erem, if we must be so hasty then, let us speak in your tongue, a Muradinson. From where did your kin vanish? I thank you for the courtesy, Shepard. They were working towards the crew your group found from the mountain. Ah, so they came from the blasphemy then. That does not bode well. The blasphemy? Yes, the arrogant dragons wasted heath. Old trees grew there, trees I knew well. Were it not for the Sid and his fire, there would have been a reckoning for that. Indeed. You have my sympathies for your lost kin, take what respite you can in knowing that they have been avenged, though you already knew that I suppose. Aram, so Avernius is dead then. You have our gratitude. Wait, so why did you call Julian the Dragon Slayer then? The ancient tree looks at Kazdor with a dread look in his eye. Avernius is not the dragon whom Ascalon shall pierce. The way he says it speaks to a future dark, and it is enough to send chills down Kazdor's spine. What? Oh, to the hells with these prophecies. If it is fate, I can't change it can I? And if it's a prediction, you telling me will only make it worse, won't it? Back to the matter at hand, where would the rest of my kin be? Aram, that land is roved by hunters for the Sept Courts. It's possible those raiders may have taken your kin. If that is so, then you must go to Elva Karen. Where can I find that? Follow the Crimson Band in the nighttime sky for three days, and you should reach it. I warn you though, the fairy folk are capricious and hasty. Go there and you will be caught up in something larger and more troublesome than the reason you went. I'll have to manage. I asked you this boon. Could you guide my kin back to our world and allow them to continue the work? A boon it is not, but a favor returned for destroying the dragon. We shall see them safely returned. Though before you go, I would ask a boon of you, Star Crowned. The Ent says. I bear no crown and am not worthy of that title if it calls to that which I think you call to but ask. Long I have walked this land and fought the sickness upon it. Root is strong and branch is sturdy, but evil walks the north, evil that wood alone cannot match. My people do not forge with fire nor with steel, but yours are fine craftsmen. This boon I ask you, when you come into your own, I shall have need of a weapon. Remember the servant of a bad high and let a blade for trees be forged. It will take time, but it can be done. I will accomplish this. You have my gratitude, Kazdor. If you must go, then go swiftly. It does not do well to tarry in the Fey, for time slips about us. Barvindral will see to your kin, and more drafty I will be readied for you and your companions. And so, the paladins meet briefly, discuss what has happened, and then set out once again into the Fi Wild, bidding an amicable farewell to the Ents and the Dwarven crew. Traveling north and east towards Elva Karen. As they walk, Senkit asks Kazdor. Have you given any thought to those prophecies he kept mentioning? She speaks in Dwarven to keep it private. I, I have. Kazdor says, with a wary glance towards Julian. He called you Echo, what in the world could it mean? I've no clue, nor why he would call Andre Scourge. I'm aware she's hardly a beacon of pleasantry, but still any thoughts on your own title? Enough to know that he's cracked. He calls me Star-Crowned. Madness. How so? 
That was a title given to the first Dwarven King, Durin, in ages long past. Since then, it has been used to name the first king of a new clan. As though any self-respecting Doi would follow a snake fool enough to call itself king. Kazdor says with a bitter laugh. Senkit says nothing, and the two walk on. Still though, it reminded me of the old song, and this land is one for singing. He says as he leads the party on and begins to sing an old song as they march. The song of ancient kings rises from the Fey forest floor as the paladins march onwards, the weight of prophecy upon them.